I don't know if you've uh, if you've tuned in throughout throughout the day, but uh, yeah, what the, what do you think of uh, of the idea of of putting all of this together? It's been great. It's been a really good day. It was really useful. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll be able to go out with a bang. Um, so the whole, well, the, the the whole idea for this, right, was let's make sure that we can give some practical advice. And and it was great when when Leon was like, "That sounds like a really cool idea. Let's do it." Um, you know, for for their for the access to finance, you you does these regularly, and this was the the first one that we got involved in. Um, and the idea was let's give some practical advice to indies and and to their studios so that they can actually go back and be like oh i now know how to do this so i think today we've seen some some really great presentations hopefully uh, more people are going to to be able to get funding to get investment to get publishing uh from the others uh from the other panelists today and from the other speakers today uh but at the end of the day as someone who starts their own studio, you need to know concrete practical advice. And that's what I'm hoping that uh, that people are going to get from today's panel. If you have any questions as before, um, do post them in the Q&A panel. I'll also be posting everybody's Twitters in a bit. Um, and yeah, do follow us. I think uh, everybody's happy to get more followers and, and yeah, any questions that you might have, we'll do our best to answer. Um, so the topic of today's, uh, of this panel is under understanding value as an independent uh, game developer. We're going to be talking a lot about the various things that you need to keep in mind that you may not have thought about when you are starting your own studio. Um, and hopefully people are going to leave a little bit more enlightened. Um, as I said before, the, the whole idea of what we're doing with, with the Tentacle Zone and what Payload's doing with uh, Payload Studios is doing with the Tentacle Zone is that we want to help independent game developers. That's why we started and that's why, um, that's why we, um, th that's why we started the Tentacle Zone workspace as well. Uh, with the Tentacle Zone at events, we've helped about 200 games be showcased. With the workspace, uh, we've helped about 10 companies, um, have access to knowledge transfer programs, have access to networking, and Andrew, you're one of our residents. So um, it's been really great to, to have you involved with everything. Um, and yeah, for everybody else, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Um, Des, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, my name is Des Gale, and I'm the founder and producer at uh, Altered Gene. Um, we're currently working on a game called The Analyst, which was uh, very gratefully, we got a little bit of funding from the UK Games Fund. So if you're watching, thanks. Um, I do a couple other bits as well. So I'm on the, the BAFTA Games Committee. Uh, I'm currently on the UK board, maybe for another week or so, depends how that goes. Um, I'm chair of a charity called Games Aid, and I'm also a founding member of um, Park and Play, which is a diversity and inclusion group that I'm working towards improve representation of people of color, both behind and on the screen. Thanks for that. Emma? Hi, I'm Emma Cooper. I'm um, a biz dev consultant. I work at Cooperative Innovations. We put out a game this year called Space Team VR, which was a VR um, mod of, not a mod, <laughs> VR version of the classic mobile multiplayer shouting game um this year has been fun oh wow uh, previously i've run my own studio with my husband my background's mainly in 2d and mobile gaming but um become really into immersive 3d and virtual in the last couple of years thank you for that um and yeah if anybody wants to spend some really good time uh, with their friends to download space teams on on mobile or vr depending on what you have access to. Um, Andrew? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Andrew Smith. I'm the CEO and founder and design guy, I guess, at, uh, at Spilt Milk Studios. Uh, I've been making games for over sort of 15 years. Um, Spilt Milk's been running for over 10. Um, and yeah, we've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline, but we recently, in the, over the last two years specifically, I think since we joined the Tentacle Zone, um, we've been really kind of focusing on uh, charity work and um, diversity and sort of you know figuring out how we as a small studio can kind of help 
bring underrepresented people into the industry, essentially. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. So to begin with, I I wanted us to talk a bit about uh, the stages that a game dev company goes through over the years and over its lifetime and focus a little bit about the financial needs and requirements of, of a company between those stages. So I was wondering, Andrew, uh, maybe you can start us on, on how you see this and then uh, Des and Emma, feel free to, to, uh, to add to that. Yeah, I was um, trying to sort of uh, come up with some like sassy or, or like, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, eye catching names or whatever for the different phases. But um, I think it's just one of these things that you just have to kind of uh, go through. Uh, so basically, you know, um, I think that some of the, the traditional terms are like early stage and bootstrapping and all that kind of thing. And that kind of a lot of that's derived from how big your ambition is or or um how big your confidence is i suppose so spilt milk we've we bootstrapped initially um with a mix of sort of work for hire and savings and and then we've sort of moved through to um project-based funding which is quite a traditional route for games companies developers at least you know going to publishers to find money um and over the years the market's changed and situations have changed and opportunities have have kind of grown and shrunk so um you know, I think that, that we've moved into an era now where uh, there's a lot of competition for those traditional sources. And so you have to be a bit smarter and a bit, you know, think a bit more efficiently, like, uh, you know, take, take advantage of as many opportunities as possible. I mean, in terms of, any, you know, trying to apply it to any game dev company, um, I think, you know, there's probably, it's probably most easily defined through the size of the company. So we're a peculiar one because we've sort of stayed really small, you know, sub five people for, for nearly 11 years now. Um, only ramping up when we go to different projects. But I think, you know, between um, one and five people, you can probably bootstrap uh, and and your needs are perhaps um, a little bit more predictable um, on the smaller scale. So, you know, uh, you're talking about like founders and, and the first few employees and that sort of thing. I think beyond that up to sort of 10 i think is like the next weird step where it's like oh hang on we have to really start thinking about you know things like office space like how you're managing teams like maybe even hr starting to creep into there and then by the time you hit 30 employees which is kind of a bit of a sweet spot for a lot of people these days that stuff all becomes supremely important you know the hr the frameworks the business support stuff uh, and then beyond that is a big question mark for me because uh because that's like the realms of the the gods and their playthings in terms of budgets um but um yeah I, th I think that's kind of like our experience of it at least um and it's a very specific um angle on it i think thanks does do you have any any thoughts on this or anything you'd like to add uh, yeah, i mean yeah i guess i just fully agree with that i i um it's interesting to hear about the uh, the numbers of people as well because I was like, yeah, that's kind of that sounds all right. Um, there's a lot of teams I speak to where they're just like, oh, because um, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a producer. Where should we get a producer? I'm just like, listen, like if there's five of you and if you can't speak or communicate or plan anything, then a producer won't fix your problems. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, when you get to that ten stage, like where the, you've got that possible splintering of like right, arts doing that and codes doing that. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's when you start thinking about those things. Um, I, I'll save my other comment for another question. Thanks, uh, Emma. You're you're part of a bigger company, ish. Yeah, yeah. Cooperative um, got some funding, so we have investors. We have private investors, um, and previous to that, both me and so Simon uh, Barrett, who's the CEO. Um, he ran a studio called Four Door Lemon, um, and that was pretty much bootstrapped. The stuff that I was doing in the past was all, um, we were playing the game of um, trying to balance work for hire against doing our own thing. And we just never got out of that trap because we were really good at the work for hire. And actually, we just never got to make our own stuff, which was heartbreaking. Um, I think having investors is a whole nother thing. So it's freeing in lots of ways. Um, it's it's different than having clients. Um, there are lots of advantages to having investors, um, but there's also 
a, a cost so you you know you're giving a, a portion of value of your of your work and of of what what you're trying to achieve so it's it, finding a balance between the kind of the cost and what you want is the heart of this value conversation cool thanks thanks a lot for that um i think if we are to to have a look at those costs um especially when you are when you're starting your own studio a lot of the a lot of the costs can start creeping up and you know especially if you're with one of those banks that sends you notifications every time like a recurring payment happens it, it can get quite anxiety inducing um so let's talk a bit about the costs associated with building your own studio uh, because when i think about that i'm thinking about oh i need to have an adobe subscription i need to have like a, a google uh, subscription to get things like email addresses or or rent if, if you're in an office but what do you think are some of the costs that uh, the participants might find surprising uh, they need to take into consideration and here we're talking mostly about uh, uk-based uh, companies Emma, do you want to start? Um, I think one of the the surprises or possibly disappointments, but it's, it's actually not a surprise, is the ongoing cost of um, SaaS products. So cloud-based business um, support products are really useful. And actually part of the reason why going into lockdown and working remotely became so easy is because everything is online. However, as you ramp up in size, the cost of those ramps up exponentially. Um, so just being wary when you take on something like, um, we started working on Rike as a kind of project management tool, it's brilliant, but the cost kind of ramps up exponentially the more and more and more you use it the more you need it and the more you're relying on those systems i think the other thing that um andrew kind of alluded to before is as you ramp up in scale there are additional hr costs and um one of the things that you hear a lot of again and again in the games industry specifically from indie indie side of things is that we really want to look after our teams we want to look after our um workforce that our resources are people um and that becomes very expensive um and very time consuming and often what happens when you flip into the larger scale triple a um businesses they tend to not do that brilliantly i think I could, that's not controversial i can say that um and one of the reasons is it, it's really expensive. Looking after people is expensive. Um, so good HR, good legal and contracts, good um, kind of like communication tools, that kind of thing. So just, just thinking about where you wanna be in the future and actually what are the costs of running a studio with 30 people? The hardware for 30 people becomes exponential. The, the kind of the terabytes of data you're going to be storing in the cloud um so yeah growth it balances mm, that's interesting i've seen a lot speaking of SaaS products i've seen a lot of people being like we're going to use perforce because it, it has it's free up to five people and then you realize oh i need more than five users to make a game and that's when it really creeps up on you um there's what what are your thoughts on this um, uh, I mean, yeah, startups, depending what you're doing when you're starting up, like, so if you've got a lot of work for higher clients, then, um, insurance is important. You know, you need professional indemnity insurance because like in a rare instance, you mess something up, you, you will get sued and you need, well, you won't be able to float that yourself. So, um, but yeah, I mean, all the other stuff pretty much covers it. Like, it's a great point from ever like that uh, software and service stuff. Like you just like, holy shit. Um, you really like uh, one thing I see of a lot of teams and I mean, I did it myself seven years ago, but I didn't think far enough in the future. I was like, all this stuff is free. Awesome. And then it was a pain in the ass to do the research like two years later to think, okay, cool. We've got this many people. It's going to kiss this much. And the effort 
to move from that tool to the new tool was brutal. So, um, yeah, it's just yeah, spot on there. Just scars. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Andrea? Yeah, I, I, I completely... War flashbacks? <laughs> well, yeah, a little bit. I was, I was like, ooh, I could coin a term here, like people as a service, right? Because like Emma saying, like you're investing in people, right? And it's yeah. that's the way of thinking about it. Like when you're building a company, you're not like... You're, you're you're not wanting people to come in and out as you as you need them you want to be subscribed to them for want of a better phrase and 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 just just you know build that that value across uh their their whole time with you and hopefully that lasts long enough that, that everyone benefits but um yeah i think i think the insurance thing was certainly something that surprised us you know as soon as you get your um dev kits through and you know maybe maybe yeah you've got like five or six people all with like the latest gtx cards and and, and three monitors each and then you realize hang on what happens if and then you go down that road you're like oh i never even thought about this you know or, or even just traveling with a, an expensive laptop to to travel what's that to uh, some kind of event <laughs> um uh, but yeah all, all that stuff is just like oh no it's, and it's not like a huge hit but it's like anything that's unexpected has like a tax on your attention and your ability to do a good job right so all that stuff trying to just be as thorough as possible early as possible no uh, it's really interesting you mentioned you, you mentioned insurance that's something that uh with a different hat on caught me unaware as well because people were like oh you know you want to take part in this event that's great we need to see your public liability insurance and i was like what's that and then you go through the through the quotes and it's like you can either pay 80 pounds a year, which you're like, okay, yeah, we can swing that. Or if you want to have, you know, some sort of extra insurance for people falling off ladders, you need to pay 400 quid a year. I'm like, those are two very different prices. <laughs> so yeah, try try and get help from from other people in the industry whenever you're doing things like that. It's, uh, I think, as somebody mentioned before, that's the beauty of this industry. People want to help each other. And speaking of people per uh, people as a service, uh, <laughs> Andrew. Um, so you're going to work a lot with uh, freelancers or you might want to hire people at some point as actual PAYE, pay as you earn employees. Uh, can, uh, I, I wanted to ask you what, um, what's the way that you work with, with people and what are the differences between the different types of, of contracts as far as you know, between hiring somebody as a freelancer, hiring them on something like a zero hour contract or a, or a full-time contract and if you've had to deal with all of this. Um, who wants to start? Oh no! You go. I'll go first. Why not? I've, we've the highlight done, chose you. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, yeah, we've done all of the above and and some extras. You know, over the sort of ne nearly eleven years. So, you know, um, uh, yeah. So, the, so the big three, right? As you mentioned, the big three. Geez. Um, yeah, you've got you've got freelancers where it's just literally, you know, you're trying to essentially hire someone's time you know, a, a distinct block of time or for a deliverable, there is some variance there. And, you know, like, like people are used to kind of being flexible and there's ways to figure that out, but it's basically an agreed amount of time with a deliverable and uh, an amount of money, you know, and then a little bit of room for sort of back and forth, just so that neither side sort of takes the mickey. Um, we've always tried to, because we've done enough work for hire as freelancers that, you know, we, you know, I, th I think it's, especially small companies they should be able to pay you pretty quickly you shouldn't be looking at like a 60 day payment term on the end of something that you've spent two weeks doing you know that's completely absurd um but it makes you flexible right on, on both sides um and that's something that we've done a lot of and and and, and a lot of the time that can go up, you know many many months and, and i think i'm not an expert on this but there are there is a point at which the way that you treat and the sort of the responsibilities that you give to a, a freelancer um sort of transfers them in legal terms into something that you have to consider them as a as a as a, an employee essentially so that has ramifications you have to be aware of and so as you you know as you build relationships with, with freelancers and both sides are willing to give a little bit more a little bit more and that's sort of a natural thing um you need to be aware that there is a point beyond which the tax man will look at them as an employee and that that has an impact um obviously employees you know you you um if you're a big proper company, I imagine you have a probation period of two or three months and, you know, just so that everyone can make sure that they've made the right decision. And that does work on both sides. It's not just for the company's benefit. Um, but, but then, yeah, you're looking at um, pension and, and, and employees tax and all that kind of stuff um, adding onto it. And so it's not, 
it's not just as simple as you know sort of a one for one pound for hour as as it is with a freelancer um and um and you want to be careful right if you're you're building a company it's literally the people that, that are the bricks and um they absolutely affect especially early on um, how the, the company operates, how they deal um, with other companies and, and individuals that your customers, the people that are playing your games, the kinds of games you're going to make. Um, you know, the founders are, you know, their personalities come through uh, through those early stages. And as you build people around that and teams around that, it kind of only solidifies it. So you need to be very, very cautious and careful about um, hiring the right people. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the, the whole sort of zero hour stuff uh, it's a bit weird. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of cases where people are, um, keen to offer, you know, very low, um, I guess, low risk, low commitment sort of arrangements. Um, and, and honestly, uh, any freelancers doing that are probably not helping freelancers in general because it makes them more easily exploitable. It's a market that as companies, we are able to kind of like spot, you know, trends in, I suppose. Um, and, and as a company, you don't want to be doing it because it's, it's already the power balance is quite like wonky, you know? Um, and so you don't want anything that like makes that worse, um, or exaggerates it. Right. Um, and so for us, like being completely honest, we've got the very sort of strange situation at the moment with a couple of people. So we've brought two people on during, during the last sort of six months. Um, and, we're sort of straddling that line We're we're trying to figure out the point at which, you know, they've been freelancers that we've worked with on previous projects. We want them to be full time. We can't necessarily afford that. Um, so we've, we've kind of worked with them because we've got that history to, to figure out a contract that makes sense for them. So there's all kinds of caveats that, that actually work in their favor. So like if they want to cancel the contract, uh, they can do it at like zero days notice. They can just tell us and they're gone. And that's, that's brilliant. You know, um, there's like a, a, a cap on how much of their time they are billing us for and, and that we will, you know, beyond which they, they, you know, the, the, the understanding is we, we, we don't go beyond that. And we're just trying to be super careful, super open and honest, but you can't necessarily do that with people who are just fresh to your company, right? These are people where, in a different world, we would just hire them straight away because we're so, we've worked with them for six, seven years and we know that they're the right people But we and, and they want to work with us as well. But that's a really like odd case and it's not something that should be used as an example. Um, and it's something that I know I'm bringing it up as an example, but it's like there are always ways of wrangling it, but you just have to be super respectful. And as an employer, you have to understand that you have the position of power and that you must not exploit it. That's, that's like the bottom line, right? So, yeah. Cool. No, I mean, that's, that's a really good way of putting it. Uh, does Emma, do you have any, any thoughts on that? The, do these uh, situations that Andrew is talking about uh, seem similar uh, to something that you might have gone through maybe? Yeah, I think um, I've been in all three situations. So I've been an employee, I've been an employer, and I've been a freelancer. And actually, initially, my contract initially with Cooperative Innovations was as a freelancer. So I had a a short term two days a week contract um, and it just became a really long very good job interview um, and that goes both ways so like I having been an employer know my value in the market I know the value of the company in the market I know that um, relationships are everything and actually working with Simon and Brian for a couple of months it became very obvious very quickly that we really get on that they're very much on the same wavelength their values are the same as my values and they were building something that I wanted to be a part of so it, that kind of relationship building is really is really important and I think that it just depends on the person and it's that having the ability as smaller businesses to have that individual relationship with each employee with each freelance function of the business means that you can tailor it and you can be considerate to people's needs you can be flexible and not treat people like automatons or machines um, and that's something that's really really important to us thanks there's yeah, so I think for me, um, it was very largely dictated by what stage we were in. So 
when um in the you know first couple of years it was like i i knew i didn't want to waste money on office um like i knew that we, yeah, we didn't want to get our big straight away we, we couldn't even afford to um so initially we definitely started with like the film model where like okay look we've got this project i know some big hitters in these areas that can help us deliver this really well so let's just get together for this short thing and do it um but then obviously uh, as the years progress you just like okay cool so and, uh, and obviously starting to chase money down the issue became and still is well then like who's the core team and it's like at the minute there's two of us who are like regulars um me obviously because my company and, and someone else um and it's it, you just keep going back with the force it's like if i need to hire people that immediately jumps me out of this kind of um uh, from a recruitment perspective like out of the indie world like just into everyone's world like if i want to get someone i'm competing with these two here i'm competing with ea and all that stuff and then when you're in that fight it becomes about obviously salary which i can't match benefits and all that stuff so um i mean that's my that's one of my personal reasons why i've been resistant to doing that um because that's one of the most dangerous phases for a business is that growth period right going from bootstrapping startup like into like oh shit there's 10 of us if this project doesn't land or if we don't make any revenue like that's people's marriages houses you know all that shit like i was like oh okay um so until someone like drives up to my house with a big track of cash then um employees just won't be it for me um but uh but yeah i mean contrast is working well like for us and as uh as you said um yeah i think the limit's two years for um people being contractors that should be employees um and yeah like you said there's other ways around it as well like if the contract's loose, like they're just doing regular stuff, like yeah, you're gonna, you're, they'll, they'll spot that and you're going to get in trouble. But if they're delivering a specific thing, um, it protects you from that. And yeah, delivering specific projects is yeah, kind of what we've been going for um, and what we will, we're going to have to do until that Santa turns up with money. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. I mean, thanks a lot for that. It's it's really interesting, and I think um, in terms of freelancers, it works the other way around as well. Like, you, um, if that freelancer is working with more than one company, even if they're doing regular bits of work, it's going it's going to protect you a little bit better as a as a company. Um, <clears throat> So uh, there, we've already had a question around HR and I wanted to kind of like go into this uh, discussion and talk a bit about the support roles uh, that the studio can bring on board. So that's anything between HR, biz, business development or biz dev, um, IT, financial, uh, you mentioned legal earlier as well. So from your point of view how can a founder decide when it's best to bring each of these roles on board and what do you think the value of each role is um as as your company ages not necessarily as it grows but as it ages des do you want to start oh yeah sure um oh man that's that is a big question um i think in this day and age we're tech companies so if you need it support at like between the five and ten people level uh, yeah i think you've got other problems um hr hr is a big thing um and i think personally uh, oh well you have to ask my friends but like i'm, I'm quite well balanced and i've got a quite clear idea about how i want to run my company and um you know our, our policy is basically don't be a dick um and whoever we work with even though the contractors like we have a very strict like these are the terms on which we will terminate immediately these are the stuff like you should probably ask me before doing and after that everything's fine um just so everyone's clear up front because if they do something you never have that conversation afterwards it's just even though you have a contract it's, it's not quite as clean to get rid of them um but yeah after that i think emma alluded this earlier like yeah once you get over 10 people like you need to be looking after them properly like as ceo you're already busy right and you can't be doing all these other jobs um and that applies to uh business development like that is a full-time job um 
and especially if your skill is something else, right? So if you're like also the lead designer or lead artist or lead coder, like you definitely can't split yourself into three. Um, for me, I'm just a producer, kind of like the least useful person on the team. So I can soak up those other jobs. Um, and then uh, legal, I would say until you're in that million dollar range, like you don't need internal legal, like you, there's companies that will give you that advice um, at cost, obviously, but um, yeah, definitely do get it. Uh, and accountants, like you will know if you need an internal uh, money person because you'll be doing very, very well. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess this goes back to the question at the top of the, 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 the session, um, accountants and legal people, um, they are very good expenses to have up front. They will save you money. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Uh, and that's that's a good way to to look at it as something that will save you money. Emma, what what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think that a lot of what Des was saying is it's about what you want to do. So oftentimes, when people set businesses up when when we set up business up years and years ago it's because we wanted to make games we didn't want to be managers we didn't want to be um well one of us didn't want to be a marketer <laughs> one of us <laughs> didn't want to be a coder you know so you find what you're good at and then you get to a point where you've got so many things and it's just it's total plate spinning and as soon as one plate starts to wobble just a bit too much, if you're not that bothered about it, maybe it's somebody else's job. And it's like, it's the things that you care about you will get done. The things that you care less about or have less of an interest in, they're the things where you need to get other people in. So um, absolutely, accountants, we, um, because we have investors, we have to provide um really good financial reporting so we pay for we have a, a cfo we pay for accountancy um with legal um if you're doing client work or if you're working um with freelancers having really good specialist contracts that are clear about who owns the ip and what you're getting for your money and when that money is going to be paid is really important and actually increasingly over the years I've found that in the same way as um, developers you get specialist lawyers and you, you need a specialist lawyer <laughs> generic kind of business lawyers are great but actually a lawyer that understands the market that understands what on earth it is that you're talking about um, is worth a lot of money like maybe not a lot of money but the value of that is really high um, so yeah I think it's got to think about what it is that you're doing the most and what you don't want to be doing and how much that time is worth to you and if you would pay somebody else to do it hmm. I mean that's that's really interesting because um, you know the way that you're putting it it seems like you should consider all of this from the beginning you would think <laughs> the thing is we're all very because we're creative people we're driven by the output we're driven by the product we're not we, we don't think about business like I didn't know what business development was until I was I'd done it for three years um and it was only when we were trying to look at a way of replacing me for maternity leave that we were like how do we describe this um so yeah i think it would be nice if everybody started a business going and at year five we will need but it's it's one of those where you you tend to feel it as it happens hmm. that's a good way of putting it andrew what are what are your thoughts on this because you you wear a lot of hats yeah yeah that's one of the phrases i think that's really useful is like every role has a hat and so you just like buy a hat for every role that you do and then just realize how ridiculous you look you know um but yeah, um, uh, so for, for us, like we, I, I completely agree. Everything that Des and Emma have said uh, has been spot on and I completely agree with it. And 
I think just expanding on one small point for us recently, we've, you know, we've been going for like nearly 11 years. I keep saying it, I'll stop saying it. Um, and uh, we've had, you know, some success in that time. And, and, but, but we haven't had the kind of, you know, we're, we're still sort of finding out what we want to do next, right? We didn't, we didn't found our company with a, with a mission uh, other than, you know, well, we just, yeah, we want to make games and we'll figure, figure out which ones and, you know, hopefully something will stick and it'll tell us, you know, the market will tell us, whatever. And that hasn't happened, obviously. Uh, and, um, and in fact, so one, one of the things that's, that we're trying to do in, in realizing that that has been happening and we need to sort of like, what's the next five, 10 years for us is that, so I'm, I'm pretty decent at production and managing a team. It turns out that's something that I didn't have the skills before I started, but, but have, have grown into, um, Des is a million times better, but like I can manage. Um, and, and then I'm also the designer sort of by passion and by, um, by, uh, uh, previous experience. Right. And that's the thing that like, I would love to be the creative director and that's it. Right. So fling off all the other roles, the other hats to other people, but specific combinations are actually quite dangerous. So one of the things that has, contributed to the fact that we have been less focused shall we say than we could have been was indecision and lack of clarity from the fact that the person who is trying to be realistic about expectations about workload about shipping things the producer about managing the team and all the realities of it is the same person trying to shoot for the stars right and because ultimately the the, the you know it's both me right so and and ultimately the buck stops with the money like it just has to right you're running a business so that would always win. And that made us slightly more cautious than we perhaps should have been, a little less confident than we should have been, all, all of this stuff. So it's something that we've, that's been sort of affecting us and, and all that sort of thing. And, and now we've kind of realized, okay, so it's not necessarily due to talent or being too busy doing those two things. It's that having one person wear those two hats is a problem. And, and we should try and find a way to, to step away from that, so yeah. I mean that that's an interesting way of putting it like at some point you realize that you that the roles can be conflicting and at that point you bring somebody in to help with that I think another one is you, that as as I think you mentioned Emma you need to put more time into one of the specific disciplines like uh, well one of the specific roles like business development or or IT even as as just mentioned when where you're looking at oh, you know, it would be great if we could have a person full-time running and trying to get us extra business because at the end of the day, that's what a business developer does. Uh, and the CEO doesn't always have the time to do that, especially if they're also the creative director, for example, or something along those lines. Um, and I think um, it's really interesting to, to have a look at all of these. And we've talked a bit about, uh, about well, we, we've played a, quite a bit with jargon when talking about biz dev and then financial and HR. But let's, let's have a look a bit at um, money and that um, how a developer should view their money. So this is something that Andrew suggested we bring into this discussion. I think it's a really good, uh, really good topic. So from your point of view, um, how should a developer have a look at their money? Is it just something that you need to try and pile on from, from day one? Should you look at it as a resource? What exactly is, uh, and this is also where we can get into a bit uh, more technical talk. If you can try and explain a bit what, what's uh, cash flow, what's runway, and how you should have a look at this. Um, so yeah, um, I think that's, that's the general gist of it. Um, Des, what are your thoughts on this? Um, uh, let me think about this. So for me, cash flow is, um, it's just the, 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 the cash flowing in and out of the business. Um, and if you're, if you're looking after it, what that will tell you is, uh, well, basically that number should never be negative, right? Cause you, you could have issues. Um, so if you're looking after it, that, you know that gives you information to inform business development or to inform maybe like your negotiation skills like with contracts and stuff because uh if you decide to do a publisher they'll be like how much money do you need oh this is how much money i need like, okay we can have it then and if you don't pay attention to how that's deployed to you um you know you're, you're going to be a very difficult uh position um and yeah, I mean, there's tools like I used to write, uh, well, I only wrote it once obviously, but I, I had a spreadsheet formula that worked it out for me, but, um, now I just use, uh, 
uh, free agent. Like if you put the important thing is is to look at these things up, keep it up to date. Like if you do it weekly or monthly, but like it needs to be accurate. It's only as good as the data that you put into it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's when you run out of money. And then runway for me is um, if you stopped earning revenue tomorrow, how long can you keep your doors open? Like that's 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 just that. Um, yeah, so those two things that you use that to inform your business practices. So um, going back to contracts with publishers, like at the beginning, so when you're day zero, when you sign, and then you're going to get 10 grand on milestone one in two months time, like how are you going to afford to get from today to two months? Like you need that payment to cover that work. Um, and if you're paying tenants cash flow, that's will help you with that. And then the other end, um, so when you, you know, give Gold Master or the game launches, you're like, oh, awesome. You know, my, where's my check from Steam or Xbox? It's just like, well, hey, buddy, sorry to break it to you, but that's going to take you a good two months or so. Um, and that's if you're working directly. If you've got a publisher on top of that, if they're nice, you can add another 30 days. So, you know, from that last milestone payment you get, you need to make sure it lasts for three months or so before you're going to start getting royalty checks in, um, assuming your game sells. Um, yeah, sorry, did I, have I, did I ask the question? Oh, the, the, uh, so thank you so much for for explaining those. Uh, the the other the other strand of this was how should the developer look at their money? Is it just something that you hoard, or is it something oh. that you can reinvest further? Um, a bit of both. So yeah, a bit of both. Um, and that oh man, it's all tied together. So basically, when you're pitching a project, like it just you need to get the scope right. Like, I think we could all agree that in 2020, well, it's been true for the last three or four years, like, you can't spend longer than two years making a game. Like, the amount of money that costs versus getting it back, it, it's, it's tough. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's important. It's number one. If you don't have any money, you can't do anything. So, um, uh, and then hoarding it, yeah, you need to, I mean, we're talking about the UK here, so you need to keep 20% of that back. Everything you earn, just put 20% somewhere else and forget about it because in 12 months' time, Mr. Taxman is going to come and say, hey, give us some money, um, assuming you're in profit. Um, and then after that, I, <laughs> it depends what stage you're at. If you're a startup, a rainy day fund is pointless because you should be putting that into doing a product. Um, but yeah, if you're three or four years in, then it should be tax pot, rainy day pot, let's make shit pot. Thanks a lot. That, that, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Uh, Emma, what are your thoughts on this? I love the idea of the let's make shit part. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think cash cash flow is the like, lifeblood of business. Um, so we're in a really strange, well not strange, what we're making is something that takes a long time to make and um, depending on how we're selling it into the market, um, you're going to get relatively small amounts of money back over, over over potentially a really long period of time. So you've got to find a, you've got to find a balance between what you think the, the game's worth in the market, how many people you think are going to play it, um, and then do some suck it and see kind of maths and hope obviously it needs to be a lot more kind of strategic than that with a lot more actual numbers um but it's really hard because if you're spending two years with a team developing a game you need to keep the doors open and how are you going to keep the doors open have you got enough money um things always take in my experience, beyond like three to five times longer than you think they're going to take. There's always unknowns, and there's there's no there's no like having contingency is such is such a good thing. The thing that you have if you've got contingency is that you're making time, you're making space for you to make good creative decisions instead of 
bad creative decisions because you run out of cash. Um, and also, like, employing people, I think Des was saying before that he doesn't want to have to make somebody redundant. I've had to make people redundant in the past, and it's horrible. It's absolutely, it's the worst thing that I've ever done. And it like it still it still kind of makes me feel a bit sick. Um, so being aware of what how how thin you can stretch over time, what that runway is, and then what actually what the cost of the money coming back in is. So tax platform percentages if you've gone with a publisher publisher percentages all the people that have helped you along the way are going to want their cut and just making sure that the two things match and i think it's that thing if there's a lot of there's a lot of moonshots in the industry things like um oh god i forgot fall guys at the moment it's just it's just rocking everybody's world but actually that's their 150th game they've been around for a really long time <laughs> and that's that's not an overnight success that's that's a long investment in time and energy and thinking and i think that um cash flow is really important so that you can keep moving forward so that you can acquire all the information and the knowledge and invest in yourself and your people um on the off chance that you might get one of those moonshots but also there's a lot of middle ground so with indie games there's a lot of like decent income to be made but you've just got to keep open um that wasn't a very good answer either i think i think there were some good points in there um <laughs> <laughs> so definitely uh i mean even even just trying to think about how are you going to to keep your keep enough money but also spend enough money to be able to reach game number 150 then yeah. that's you know that that's a good way of looking at it um yeah. Andrea? I, sorry sorry Emma. i was just gonna say i think what des said before is it's all wrapped up it's all wrapped up in the same thing that it's very it's a very finely balanced question that's mm -hmm. hard to answer yeah, it really is. It really is. So for us, like, um, getting like a bit specific, like we, we have a runway of four months, um, which for some people is like not enough for some people. It's like, like too, too much, or they like to live a bit more dangerously. Um, you know, I think it's something that we'll, we'll revisit every sort of six months because the market changes. Right. And the thing, the thing that defines that four months for us is, um, it's not actually, it, 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 the, the question is always what what is the least time you need to like have confidence that you will find another source of income right so we think in four months with basically like with the reputation that we have the ex expertise that we have um and the connections that we have we would be able to find some work for hire right and and for us that's not a lot for just the the two three four of us to to get by on right so that all of that basically goes to about four months for us that's what we think and that's what we operate on but obviously as we staff up that has to extend um and as things change that has to adapt right so so for us and and this sort of i know we've got a question in the in the document if you peek behind the curtains but like a piece of advice i wish i'd given myself right back at the start was not even just business level uh, sorry business plan type stuff i'd just be like just know where your comfort zone is for the runway and spend beyond that like invest like you know it's it's all about for us it's all about building this team now and 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 i don't regret any of the stuff that we've done getting to this point because you know that's that's all part and parcel of it but it, you know i think we've certainly been guilty of being a bit sort of um i don't know english in our approach to sort of um growth and being excited about ourselves and all that sort of thing um you know uh and and, and we're and, and basically since we've been really driven by runway and beyond that we'll just we'll, we'll invest it if we've identified something worth investing in and that might be a person that we think we'd just love to work with them or it might be a role that we want to fill or a skill gap or something like that or a decent share like honestly you know um working from home on a on a on a, on a garden chair with three cushions on it was not doing anyone any good um 
all of that stuff, you know, and it just frees you up. It just means that at that point you've got a number and okay, you go back and you recheck it, but like, you're like, okay, is this number, you know, is, is, have we hit the point where we need to look for it for high? No, cool. Okay. What are we spending on? Like genuinely, and it should be an exciting thing. It's growth. It's, it's potential and it's investment in, in your future. Um, yeah. That's that's a really good way of of looking at it, Andrew. Thanks a lot for for that contribution. Um, everybody has done work for hire here. I think uh, you've all mentioned that, and everybody has also employed people. Uh, I think you've also mentioned that. Um, let's talk a bit about two things. So, what are some rules of thumb uh, that you think are good when it comes to calculating uh, your salary? So how much you're actually going to pay yourself and your employees as, as an employer and how much you're going to uh, charge for your services. Um, because a lot of the time, what I've seen people do is um, they underbid in order to get a contract and then they realize they can pay themselves enough or their teams enough. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, um, Andrew, do you want to start? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm going to be mean, and this is coming from someone who hates numbers. But if you're if you're undercutting to the point where you can't pay yourself, you haven't done the maths, and that's like like what are you doing? Um, find someone who can, and, and that's literally what I did. I can't do that stuff, so I got a I, I got a co-director. Um, uh, something we're guilty of would be um, not again. I guess just being a bit English about it, we're just not really valuing ourselves properly. Um, you know, we we charge a decent rate. And, uh, you know, we do sort of have like a mates rate, I guess, for, for studios and especially people that we understand are in a similar position to us. And it's like, okay, this could build something, but, um, ultimately you, you should be charging more than, than your rate is right. You, you know what it takes to, to, um, to keep the lights on. You should be charging more than that. That's just like your basic first rule. And then secondly, um, if you have successfully, completed a piece of work for hire you should increase your rate on the next one like you know it's it's you've got to approach it as if i was to go for a, like work for a company as an employee and then go somewhere else it's going to be quite uh, odd if i do that under the circumstance where i'm getting paid exactly the same it's like but i've done more i'm better than when i started right and then it's demonstrably that way right especially as a studio so you've got to be putting your, your prices up and then you know there is a point at which it's stops making sense to do that unless you're in like the land of consultancy uh, and all that sort of thing but as a studio you know i think you, you you have a value and whatever's in your head you should you should go over it because you have you see it's like when you ship a game right all you see are the bugs all you see about your work is is the mix of the good and the bad whereas actually what you're selling is the good no one's interested in the bad and you can kind of like work to do better and and, and make make better of it um and as a sort of a, an aside to that like something that we always have so talking about rules of thumb is we don't do work for hire unless we're going to learn something out of it so the money is is maybe two-thirds of the equation like honestly maybe half um you know new engine uh new tech new genre something that's specifically like ideally something that we're oh we're going to do a game a bit like that so let's learn how to do it on someone else's dime like that's how it's that's nobody's in under any any sort of like illusions here right um so so something that we always always do and it's not happened okay we always try to do it, it hasn't always happened but but we always try to learn something and that's sometimes that's on us we're just like oh we didn't learn anything whoops uh, and sometimes that's just the nature of the, the project <laughs> there's what are your thoughts on this um yeah i i guess so i've been quite lucky like i so i used to be a triple a and i've slowly come down um, like you know, working for a small developer and then on my own and stuff like that. So I have a good idea about the crazy dev month rates that teams get paid. Um, so so it, it, it's pretty much like what Andrew said. It's just common sense. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'm not naughty dog, so I can't charge that much. I'm not quite sumo yet, so I can't charge that much. Um, and then you just keep bringing it down. And then what I think this is quite similar to Andrew as well. Like I wanted to find that sweet spot between, okay, what do I actually need? And then what's like a good market fit? Like, and in fact, I'm pretty sure I asked you, Andrew. So yeah, I asked a couple of devs like, eh, so uh, what are you charging out these days? Um, and then I'm like, oh, I'm definitely better than those guys. I'm charging more than that. Um, and yeah, so you just, you just, you just scale it that way. Um, 
and then uh, so that's at a studio level. And then for me, because I, I contract out as a as a producer as well, um, that's I mean, that's slightly easier. I'm just like, well, if I had a real job, my last salary was this. Um, therefore, you know, you just do the maths and divide that out. Um, and then uh, then mates rates comes into it because, of course, not everyone can pay the same. Um, and you kind of you know, depending on your needs, you adjust who your clients are, don't you? But um, uh, I, I get this one I would say earlier, but I think one thing at the minute, which I've been really enjoying over the last couple of years, is just how collaborative, like we've all been at our levels. Like, you know, I've done some stuff um, for other studios for free, but it's not free. Like it's been in kind, like they've also done stuff for me, right? There's no financial transaction. Um, and again, what Andrew's saying, like, they learned something by doing the job for me and I helped out another studio because I like helping people. So yeah, it's, just, it's a really nice system to have. And, um, you know, I think definitely at our level, we're not super rivals yet. Um, so like if we all sort of like come up together, like I, I think, you know, it's only really good for the industry. Right. So yeah. Well, and lastly, Emma. I want to vote for price fixing. Can we price fix? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that is, it sometimes it's just like, what? How do I even start to decide what I want to charge for this? Um, years and years and years ago, an agency in Manchester um, had a flow chart, and I nicked it, and I still use it. So the questions I ask share myself it, are: share it. Um, <laughs> Will I win any awards? <laughs> Will I learn anything? Um, is it going to help anybody else? How much do I not want to do this job? And then depending on where it fits on that scale, depends on how much. And Oh God, when do they want it? Do they want it? Do they want a moon on a stick right now? And I really don't want to do it. That's a really high price down to, I'm going to help out Des and Andrew because there's this project that's awesome and we're going to help people. I'm going to get loads of praise and wonderful glory out of it. It's a no brainer. I'm going to do it for free. So it's, <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. But actually what, what Des said is true is just talking to peers, going to, oh, obviously we can't go to events anymore, but doing stuff like this, talking to each other, um, seeing what other people are charging out, Talking to clients is always a good thing. Um, talking to people that you've worked with before about why they chose you and why, whether they felt like it was good value, would they come back? Like those sorts of questions, if you're English, really hard to ask, um, but actually they're really valuable um, and it helps you build a confidence up. Genuinely, most of the time, most of the work that's ever been done ever by a creative person is nowhere near as much as they should have charged out um, because we're rubbish at estimating how long things are going to take. And because we love it, because it, we would be doing it anyway, we're like, I pay you, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's just fine. Finding a balance and being aware of the market. So talking to other people and talking to your clients as well and saying, like, how much do you want to pay for it? How much have you got genuinely? Um, and if people are funny about answering that question, then maybe you don't want to work with them. That's a good way of putting it. And I think another, another important thing for companies uh, is that it's okay to hire people for a day a week or for half a day a week, right? In terms of how much you can actually afford that, especially if it's going to be an ad hoc thing where it's like, well, we need a social media person to help whoever it is that's managing the social media accounts or something along those lines, right? Or we just need a consultant art director to have a look and tell us if our art direction is completely wrong or, you know, the, or any other type of consultants. Um, we have, I, we have three more questions that really like us to go through. Uh, so we will go a bit over, but until we do, if that's okay with everyone, um, before that. we, before we do that, um, I have a question here for Emma, uh, in terms of outsourcing HR. Uh, so do you think it's cheaper or more beneficial to outsource HR or to have, uh, an HR person slash department within your company? 
<laughs> um, I think that certain aspects, if you're a small team, is outsource it. Um, for other aspects, you need to, as a as an employee, you have responsibilities and you need to understand what your responsibilities are. Um, so it's finding the balance, finding the the specific legalities. I would definitely talk to a consultant about a specialist. Um, I think things like um, what's generally expected in the market, again, it's talking to other directors, other founders, um, and talking to your staff. Um, but yeah, I think it depends, is my answer to all the questions. <laughs> Ask around. Ask people from the industry who are in a similar position to you. That's probably a good, yeah. good way of looking at it. Um, so one thing that I was really curious about is uh, what's a mistake that you see game developers and small st and studios make all the time when starting up their studio, uh, starting up their business that you believe can be easily fixed. So yeah, I think I think there's there's quite a lot of value in that. Who who wants to start? Go, Emma. Oh, yeah, um, I think marketing and market. So y you might love your, your wizard dungeon crawl again, but actually, who's going to play it? And how much is it worth to them? Um, people are weird about valuing games. They're weird about valuing video games. People, uh, freemiums kind of throw in the market like right off its axis, which means that the value conversation gets really awkward when you're talking to consumers. So actually doing some market research, thinking about who the end user is, maybe making games for underserved end users would, would be nice. Um, and yeah, and then marketing and actually, you know, telling people that you made a game, telling enough people that you made a game and where they can buy it and how much it is <laughs> because quite a lot of people focus on the content and the making of the game and the joy the joy of making a game and a little bit sometimes don't think about the what what's after that yeah build it and they will come it's no longer a viable business model is it mm -hmm. does what are your thoughts on this mistakes that can be easily fixed um I think de definitely working in a, in a silo, like, um, and I've got two sides of this. So when I speak to student teams, they're just like, oh, yeah, got this idea. We're going to start our thing straight out of university. I'm like, well, good luck with that. Um, and like not being receptive to advice and stuff. Just like, you know, we can get head down and do it. It's like, uh, all right. And then the other side, uh, which is the side I'm on, is kind of... Um, when I first started out, I was crippled by fear. So, you know, I'd worked at AAA, I'd made some amazing games, I know how games are done, but then, you know, I didn't have millions to make this thing. So I was just like, right, I'd had this immense, like, self-imposed pressure to, like, create something. It's like, you know how to do this, Des, you just do it. Instead of uh, literally, you know, speaking to other people, but like, hey, like, um, is this the right way to do it? Because, you know, I wasn't Lee Coder on this thing. Um, yeah, that was tough. Like, just not speaking to enough people early enough. Because um, I'm old now, but, like, it's great to do this now because the great conversations are, like, hey, buddy, like, I went down that road and it wasn't good. Like, don't, just trust me. Don't, well, I'll give you examples why not to do this. Maybe try this instead. Like, that will save you a lot of stress and, and money. Like, yeah, that's the biggest one. And it still happens, obviously, because people are people. But, yeah. Yeah, no, good good point. Andrew? Um, yeah, there's a few things. I guess, like, uh, one of my favorites is, like, you, you have to define what success is for you, right? And that is so key. It's different for everyone. Um, you know, I've found it really hard. I flip flop. I'm like, Oh money. Oh, uh, actually it's not even, it's not even that much money. Just, I'd like to not have a mortgage one day sooner than maybe the current thing is. Or then it's like, no, I just want to win a BAFTA. I don't care. It's about the art, whatever it is, it's valid. Right. And you just need to write it down and that's your business plan. Right. 
and that's it and you and you know and hey check in on it and and it's okay for it to be wrong or for you to change your mind like 10 years i'm a different person you know the team's different etc it's fine it changes and so sort of like related to that is broadly i mean again going back to me 10 years ago i just said like i know you don't want to write a business plan but you need to even though it will be wrong and like just have an idea of the next five six steps it doesn't like you know i'm assuming there's quite a range of people talk like that, that we're that we're sort of presenting to here but like especially for small indies who are just i just kind of just i have this idea for a game that i think it's amazing got some maybe some friends that want to make me with it and i think you know and it's realistically going to be like decent and you've got like the chops for it or whatever even then just having like the the end goal and just figuring out a few sensible steps in between so that you've got a measure something to go right hang on we're here and we thought we'd be here or or or, or whatever and it can be wrong and it will be wrong and it maybe should be it's just something you have to have a map of some kind right um otherwise you will just get lost and uh, and i think that's probably something that again as emma said we're all creatives really and we're a bit allergic sometimes to sort of doing the eating our greens or whatever but it is worth it it is good for you um yeah another good thing that i've seen uh advised is review that plan regularly um so yeah that's 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 also a good one like 30 under 30 you should probably change that once you go over 30 and you still haven't won it <laughs> so yeah um i i had a, another one um just uh and i, I guess this is fair because it's not super easy but scope um you know your first game or your third game like the, the people don't really match the creative intent to what the, the sort of resources they've got um and obviously it's easy because you know we're inspired by the stuff that we play and what we see right it's like, oh, i want to make a game like that it's like well if you just look through the credit list like it's your team 50 60 people then you know you're, you're gonna struggle um yeah and i again as we as we've all been saying like it's all rolled in like when you're starting out like how much money you got or how much money you think you're gonna need what people you have it's like what scope a game can we do like you know can we do it 12 months can we push to 18 um yeah just every every day that scope there's a big a big issue so no that's that's definitely a good one um the next to last question is what are some decisions you've made that brought you great returns for your studio from a value point of view uh, Andrea, I'm going to assume that joining the, the Tentacle Zone workspace is uh, is the one for you, but uh, <laughs> I, I'll, ju I'll just say that, and and I'll let you choose a a slightly less easier one. No, I, I, <laughs> it, it's so bad that it seems like I, I have to say it now, but it has it has been amazing. Like to dwell on that just momentarily, I won't try and you know belabor the point but like for the longest time we were like we don't want a studio we don't want anyone other than like a tiny team of freelancers we don't like what's the point in an office all this kind of stuff and a lot of the reasons still stand but like especially now right we're paying rent um but um uh the the right place and it's a co-working studio and there are a lot of devs and a publisher and a marketing firm and a funding firm you know all like it's a brilliant mix of people and and, and honestly like we have genuinely had value out of that um and I would say that some of the reason for that isn't just the space and it's sort of related to like what, where I was thinking is like, it's not really a decision, but we have like so much of this industry is about the people in it, right? Like any industry is really, but like we're such a young industry that we've still got like the people who founded it active and like contactable and they can give you advice if you ask for it and all this sort of stuff. But like, and then it's such a creative and passionate industry and it's one that brings so many skills together that I think it's a really unique the collaborative industry right and so what that means is that everyone in it understands that on some level so where i'm getting to is that like the connections that you make are so so important in this in this industry i think you could get by and be successful in other industries that aren't like this without trying to go to as many events as possible you know putting your hand up volunteering for stuff being nice to other people doing good work having a reputation all of that stuff adds up and like we've had we've been really lucky to be asked on a few occasions to sort of like do talks to students and things like that and one of the one of the things that is really f it's kind of rewarding is like there is a path like a direct path between every opportunity that we've ever had and like each one is like maybe one or two degrees of separation from the previous one and it's almost never been for us at least 
oh, you got like a number one game that month on Steam. Cool, make another one. Like that's that's such an outlier, right? Like that does not happen to most people. So what it has been has been just, yeah, like working with people and staying in touch and being good and decent and respectful. And I think um, a decision that you could make is to like recognize the value of that because it's so sort of hard to pin down and it does sound a bit silly. But it's true. It's genuinely true. And I think it is really specially unique to this industry. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Emma? Um, I think a little bit connected with that and um, with your previous comment about like what is success is emulating heroes. So um, years and years and years ago, somebody who I really admired won a BAFTA for making a game. And it just, it never... I think it was before there was a specific games BAFTAs and I just it's just not something that I'd occurred to me that that's something that you could do and I wanted that so much so much that it drove the direction of our business so it made me look at entertainment and television as a market that we could go and work in um, and then I was nominated for one and I have since worked on BAFTA winning projects with amazing teams doing amazing things um, and the thing that happened after that was I didn't shift my goal so I didn't I didn't look back and go right so now what's your next success um, and I kind of spiralled into a massive depression but um, I think the thing that got me into that position was emulating people that I really admired um, and turning up and being present and not being jaded about things. So kind of going, do you know what? I have a goal that I want to achieve and I'm going to do as much as I can to get in, into that position. And on the way, building relationships with people, meeting people. I met Simon years and years and years ago and I have remained friends with him and actually working with him now is just brilliant. I freaking love it. So I think turning up, emulating your heroes and kind of like just trying to have a good attitude when you are there. Thank you. Des? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, networking, uh, even though... I have a fundamental dislike for for cliques and clubs. Um, unfortunately, it is all about relationships and, and people that you you know make genuine relationships, not not just who you know. But yeah, um, yeah, and similar similar to to what Andrew just said. Um, you know, I can look at conversations and situations that I've been in where you know we had a good time and I was you know a good person and like you can see where that's boomeranged back like you know 18 months to five years later which is awesome um i guess that's just maybe for the type of people we are like you know i i'm very much a person who's all about the situation and the there and then like the there and now um so i don't think oh i mean apart from smith the only reason i talk to him is because maybe we'll do something later but like um genuinely like i guess i have a good time with people and i'm not thinking about oh yeah they've won a bafta or you know they work for this company maybe they can hook me up later like just um yeah being super genuine about that i think is is, is key and um yeah specifically what did i do that good roi um yeah actually andrew missed it earlier i i put my prices up um yeah i i and <laughs> it's a little bit of error as well. So I didn't actually want to do the job. So I was just <laughs> like, right, okay, like, hmm, let's just double it, see what happens. And uh, they said yes. So I was like, ah, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> but uh, but because it was double, that meant I could palm it on to someone else. So like, it was like, it all worked out nicely. But um, yeah, it just reframes you. It's like, well, okay. And I guess for me, at this specific instance, like that company wasn't in that bracket like you know get a gist of who will pay what but i was like oh okay um yeah and then obviously that helps you to future things but um yeah yeah i think yeah common themes just relationships right yeah 
Definitely, definitely. And I mean, a lot of the time you don't know that those relationships are going to play out later. So I first met um, one of the people who hired me in 2012 because I was a student and I was at the game jam that, that she was organizing. Um, and then, you know, I met the Tentacle Zone in 20. 16 2015 something like that uh just because one of my friends was exhibiting in the tentacle zone um and you know 2019 i'm working with them which you know it's these types of relationship aren't gonna aren't going to happen overnight you never know when you're gonna be meeting your next employer sort of thing i think there's you you said it very well when you said you know don't be a dick uh and <laughs> A, a, a very good one for me is don't expect things to happen overnight. Sometimes they do, but a lot of the time you need to put a lot of work into it and you need to 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 till the land quite quite a lot in order to actually see the results of your work and to um, to get that recognition. And as as you were saying, Emma, you know, I think your story with the bathtub where you're like, I saw this, this person, you know, I really looked up to them. They uh, they changed my life. That I wanted to be like them so i put the work in and you know it's you haven't won a bafta yet so you know you're you still have quite a bit to go but you've changed you've improved you've been able to be successful all along the way um and i think the last the last uh thing that i want to talk about is opportunity cost because we've talked a lot about, about financials we've talked a lot about hiring other people about being hired ourselves but lastly um let's talk about opportunity cost so um let's uh let's think a bit about what it is does anybody want to talk about opportunity cost and how they see it for me opportunity cost is the time or money it takes to exploit said opportunity um and i guess for a games context uh, it's not so, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but there used to be competitions um, where like, oh, hey, uh, make a prototype for this and maybe you'll get signed and win money, blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, it, that sounds really cool. Like the number, like 100 grand. Yeah, I want some of that. Obviously, you're ignoring the 50, 60 other teams that are going to do it. Um, and yeah, you're ignoring the two to three months it's going to take you to do the thing and what that costs and money. And is that or that money will be over hundred uh, less than hundred grand? Otherwise, you would be interested. Um, yeah, like th yeah, that's it for me. And I to go for the slight tangent. Um, another thing that people don't think about this is when they're doing business development or when they're chasing like you know publishing deals and stuff like that. Um, publishers have the money; they're not in the rush, so they can take as long as they like. But for us who are chasing those deals, we, you know, you need to get to a point where, like, you, and it, there's no science. It's just it's an art where you is this discussion, negotiation going in the right direction, or are they holding us until another company says no, or they, you know, it, it, and trying to work that out because, um, yeah, it's tough. Like you, you can't it, going back to the top of the session, right? Where we're like, we can't wear more than one hat at a time and so when you're paralyzed in this negotiation like you're not you're not doing your proper stuff right um yeah yeah that's opportunity cost for me yeah yeah cool andrew what's what's your take on this opportunity cost and how it relates between like work for hire and your own stuff and yeah i mean it's one of my favorite things to think about in a weird way because it's a real like trap right it's and i i completely agree with what everything guys was saying um and uh and i think there's like an even another level if you're like super super sort of cautious about stuff there's the idea of the the work that you will miss out on potentially right so let's imagine a world in which you know you have two offers for work for hire and you know you you just have to pick blind that maybe they even pay the same, right? But the opportunity cost there is that the other one, you don't know what might happen with it, right? So at all times, when you're thinking about, you know, doing work or, or spending money on work or, 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 you know, landing a contract even, there is a, a an element of you're going to potentially be missing out on something. And so when you're, especially when you're costing up your value of your time, especially when you're doing work for hire as a studio that's trying to make their own stuff, 
you know, the, the, the cost there of chasing that work for high opportunity is quite big because the time you're spending, it's not just the money balance, right? The, the wages versus income and stuff. It's, it's the, I'm not spending that next six months building our knowledge about our game and our team. And that's like, is that process? I don't know. It's pretty close. So like there's, there's that sort of layer to it as well. Um, and, and with, you know, the, the art, as, as Des said, is, is kind of like having an idea of what you don't want to do. And, and, and as Emma pointed out, you know, if you don't want to do the work, jack your prices up. And that balance is the opportunity cost, right? Um, uh, but like, for example, we've been p p um, pitching around most of this year, a couple of projects, things like that. And we've actually shelved one. And, and, and actually, we did that as publishers were coming back to us and saying, hey, we want to follow up with this. And we were like, well, we don't actually like it wasn't that blunt but it was very much a conscious decision it's like we shouldn't be focusing on this the opportunity cost is too high like it's it's diluting our focus um and um yeah like having a business plan and all of that kind of stuff helps you realize like it's as much about figuring out what you shouldn't or don't want to be doing as it is what you do or should be doing so yeah mm. thanks and lastly Emma. yeah absolutely what what are we not what are we what are we not going to do is so valuable um i think just thinking about the amount if you're pitching for work the amount of time you're putting into pitching for work um there are ways of doing it so you kind of get into a flow and you get a pitch deck and you kind of you start boilerplating everything so everything's the same every time you pitch it but then you get knockbacks because everything that you say is the same thing and it's not exciting anymore um and actually deciding is it worth is it worth my time to invest in trying to get this opportunity when i could be doing something else when i could be spinning that other plate that's starting to fall off the stick pole i don't know um i think that is is such an important it's such an important thing mm. it this is really interesting and I'll, I'll say this and then um, I think that's that's the end of the panel. But when I was talking to, to uh, one of my bosses about who was doing a lot of charity work as well, uh, about how to balance the time that you have between the different opportunities that you have, he always said, you know, first do the things that pay you enough to be able to pay rent and do, you know, the basic things that you need and then you do everything else. And I think you know th th this for me fits well into into what uh what you've been talking about especially andrew what you're saying uh you know in terms of well uh we have a team to pay you know at the end of the day uh we need to pay rent and other costs as well but at the same time it's and then the second level is we want to build our own things uh and we want to learn uh, about uh, uh, about the things that we build and then the third level is let's be experimental and and so on so i think does that sound like a good hierarchy, I guess? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us on the panel today. Uh, thank you to the, the attendees who s stuck around till the end. Uh, it's been really great to, to be able to chat with you. Emma, Des, Andrew, thanks so much for for taking the time and going uh, into extra time to be able to, into overtime to football analogy there uh, to be able to to answer all of these questions uh, i hope that uh these helped and i hope that people have left with uh with more knowledge than they had coming in thank you everybody uh and that's about it from from my side